Spree stem Salsier was born and raised in Houston, Texas, where she discovered her passion for marine biology. As a sea scout, while sailing on her family's boat on the Gulf of Mexico or through a high school, she attended Ohio State University as a third generation faculty, where she earned her undergraduate degree in zoology. After her undergraduate degree, she took a year off but decided that she missed academia. So went back to complete her Master's of Science in Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal organ, organism Biology, while studying genetic connectivity of intertidal sea anemones. During her Master's, she met the LDS missionaries and was baptized shortly before graduating in 2009. She then went on to earn her PhD in Environmental and Evolutionary Biology from the University of Louisiana, where she studied gene flow between isolated deep sea bamboo coral population. During her PhD, Dr. Salsia had the chance to name two new species of deep sea coral, three new genera, and a new family. That is also when she met her husband, Kyle, while working on her PhD and had twin girls during that time. Dr. Sassier worked as a professor at the University of Louisiana and the University of Houston before coming to BYU Hawaii last year. She is expecting her third daughter any day now. Okay, so thank you. So seriously, it could happen like now. Okay, so we'll go ahead with the talk because it didn't happen. Um, uh, so my leadership story. So my, my family, the He Stands, and now trying to incorporate this into the Sociés, is uh, our motto is we have a plan. This might not always be the best plan, but at least we have a plan. And we have a place where we're going. Uh, even if it takes us a couple tries to get there, it's not uncommon for us to leave for vacation, well, now, Honolulu, um, without returning a couple times because things have been forgotten. But we have a plan. Um, so moving forward with that, um, I'd like to introduce you to Esprit. This is on the first day of grad school, this one up here, and this is this morning. As you can see, there's very little difference between the two pictures. I'm just as enthusiastic. I, uh, the gray hair is hidden just as well, and um, well, the computer's been upgraded, so that's nice. Um, maybe just a little bit more tired, but still, I had a plan. I had a plan that I wanted to go to school and do great things, and here I am. I feel like I'm doing great things here at BYU. Um, but it wasn't the initial plan that I had. I didn't, I didn't even know when I started out anything about BYU, uh, anything about the LDS Church or anything like that, except uh, what I had heard on, um, oh, what's that show, Sister, Sister Wives? I'm sorry to say. That's, that's what I knew. Okay. <clears throat> but my story is not only about plans and creating plans and moving forward with those plans, but also a story of mentors and mentorship. And I wouldn't be here today without the people in my life who have guided me um, and helped me become where I am today. And this is not only um, the adults and the well, the humans in my life, but um, this is also a story about Scout. Some of you guys may have met Scout because she comes to visit quite often. Uh, feel free to stop by my office, Scout might be there. Um, but this is Scout. So I wouldn't be here today definitely without, without Scout, and I'll, sh and I'll share with that uh, with you here in just a bit. But first, a little bit about me. So my family, uh, on my mom's side, is from Skye, so this area here in Scotland. Have you guys seen James Bond? Uh, any of the last James Bond? Skye, he went to Skye. We're famous, they're famous. Um, not only for James Bond, um, but they have a castle, and it's actually still inhabited by the MacLeods. 
continuously inhabited by McLeods from when it was first built. They're also real famous because there's a lot of um, interbreeding of the family, shall we say. And so there's this whole town that's basically colorblind. This is their tartan. If you look at their tartan, you would say, of course, they're colorblind. Who would, who would wear this and think they're blending into the landscape? The McLeods. That's who. Um, <clears throat> so that's my, that's my mom's side of the family. My dad's side of the family is from um, a little town in Sweden. And what's interesting is all the he stands are related. Um, so unlike like bakers or smiths, um, you don't really know, you know if you're related to them or not. All he stands in the world are related. And we all come from this one lineage. Um, and then there was this guy who decided he was going to head out on his own. And his, his, actually, our family motto at that point was not just we have a plan, but we have some land. Um, and here I stand. So that's where he stand comes from. Here I stand. Um, unfortunately, the town hasn't been very prosperous. This is, this is the town right here. Can you guys see my mouse? No. OK, well, the red house, that's the town. It's only inhabited during the summertime. <laughs> Uh, but we have some land and we have a plan. Did we follow through with the plan? No, a lot of the he stands ended up leaving. Um, but um, like most families, they, they kind of stayed together and they traveled to the new world together <clears throat> um, to Ohio. So the booming metropolis uh, of a little town called Akron, Ohio. And that's where the he stands now mostly reside. On one street called he stand court. We don't really get out much. This is, this is as far as we've traveled. Um, <clears throat> but from there, um, the He Stands have gone on to do things. They've had plans. They've gone on to try, to try to conquer the world, I guess. You could say that the He Stands like education. Um, sometimes I've, I've been accused of not just liking academia, but being afraid of the real world. So how many of you guys just raise your hand, are not afraid of the real world. Who is excited about leaving college? Who can't wait? Who's counting down the days? Yeah, more and more hands are going up. OK, <clears throat> not me. Nope. Uh, which is why I'm still here. Um, so uh, this is my father, uh, Dr. Richard Heastan. He, um, he's the, my first mentor that I can remember. Um, he has always been there for me and um, is very excited about learning new things. He actually did his um, research for his dissertation here in Hawaii. So he was studying plate tectonics and how the plates move in hot spots and stuff. So he's a, um, a physicist, a geophysicist, so studying how the plates move. <clears throat> and, um, and he always knew something about everything. And I thought that was really cool growing up. I could ask him a question and he would know something. Um, it was kind of dreadful at times. So I'd ask for help with like fractions uh, in like fourth grade and we'd get into why the planets orbit the sun and stuff, which is really daunting uh, for a fourth grader. Um, but he would always have an answer and I thought that was really great. I wanted to be somebody who always knew something about something. Um, and at one point, um, I wanted to learn how to sail. And so they got a boat, and they learned how to sail, and we joined Sea Scouts. So I was a, a Girl Scout for a while, but all we did was sell cookies, which, don't get me wrong, is great. I love the cookies. Uh, but I would eat them more than I would sell them. So um, I, wanted to, I wanted to do the things that the boys were doing. Like, why do you join Boy Scouts? OK, if you're not LDS, why do you join Boy Scouts? To play with knives and to play with fire, right? Like, that's why. You get to camp and play with knives and play with fire. And I wanted to do that, too. Um, so Boy Scouts has a venture part of them. And one of those uh, um, sections of the venture is Sea Scouts. So I joined Sea Scouts. And I would spend um, my summers sailing on the Gulf of Mexico. And that's where I first um, was really able to interact with dolphins, which is illegal. Don't. Don't do it. If you see a dolphin, don't jump off the boat. Uh, that's illegal and dangerous because the boat doesn't stop. Um, sea manatees, don't jump off the pier to swim with them. Also illegal. 
uh, don't recommend that one either. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Sea Scouts really taught me to be able to solidify this plan because you need to have a plan in Sea Scouts. You're out sailing, you're the first line of defense against disaster. What do you do if someone jumps overboard, falls overboard? Uh, what do you do? How do you stop the boat? How do you turn around? What do you do if your boat sinks? What do you do if your boat runs aground? I mean, my dad was pretty trustworthy. He gave a bunch of like 15 to 18 year olds a boat and said, good luck. Um, what do you do in these different circumstances? How do you get from point A to point B? How do you navigate? How do you find your spot on a map? And so being a Sea Scouts really helped me hone this idea of having a plan and carrying out this plan. And at this time, when I was in Sea Scouts, I really became enchanted with the idea that I was sailing on top of another world. So us as humans, um, the ocean is an extreme environment to us, right? Um, it's very hard for us to get down there and to see what's, what's underwater. We have better technology now with scuba and submarines and stuff, but it's, it's an extreme environment for, for us, but for the fish, for the whales, for the sea cucumbers, this is normal. This is, um, this is their habitat, and I was really interested in that. But I didn't know how to, at that point, make that a career. So um, I did what any uh, person would do who didn't have a plan but thought they did, is follow in the steps of my, my family. Um, so I went to Ohio State. So I could, I could have gone to any school. Really, I could have gone to any school. But if I wanted to go to the best school, according to my family, I had to go to Ohio State. So I went to Ohio State. Um, I convinced my brother to come with me because I didn't want to go by myself. He's the, not the old one, the other one. Uh, so I have a twin brother, so he was going to another school. I convinced him to come with me. Um, and there I was going to do occupational therapy. That was the plan. Uh, I started off at Ohio State and realized that biology was hard. I had to do things like read and homework and not go to happy hour. I wasn't a member at the time. Don't freak out. Uh, so, um, you know, there were things that, ha that was required of me that was pretty difficult. So um, I thought, well, this isn't coming naturally. The people who are around me um, look more like my brother than me. Maybe this, maybe it's true. Girls just aren't good at math. They're not good at science. I'm going to go do something else. What, what are my friends doing? Well, little did you guys know, you are in the presence of a prodigy. Yep. Tuba. Tuba. I played tuba in high school, and I was pretty good at it. I was like third in the state of Texas, which is a big state. So we're not talking Rhode Island here. We're talking lots of tuba players. I can do those quarter notes. I can hold a whole note for four counts without needing to take another breath. Yep, tuba. So this was the plan. Um, so I was gonna, I switched to music major. Uh, I bump, bump, bumped my way for a year and I had to take a class called oral training. So oral like hearing. And I realized that at that point, music is also hard. I don't know if you guys know, especially being um, members of the LDS church, you guys, we guys um, are very musically inclined. Have you ever been to church? Of course you've been to church. But um, like when songs come on, you guys just know the song and everybody's in tune and it's wonderful. Like uh, my last word, there was an impromptu choir and it was like I was the only one sitting in the congregation being sung to. You guys are very, uh, a very musical bunch of people. Um, we are not all so blessed and I found out that I'm tone deaf. So while I can hold a whole note, that's pretty much all I can hold when it comes to um, playing the tuba. So um, I looked around and I thought, I don't know what people are doing. What are people who I want to be like doing now? And I looked around and they were musicking, they were home ecking, they were teaching. And I thought, well, I, don't, I don't know if I'm cut out for those things. So what can I do? What can I? Um, be successful at. So uh, 
I got a dog. So this is plan D. So I got a dog. So we're now on plan D. Um, and I thought, well, if anything else, at least this gives me something I can be successful at. Because I was not successful at school. I was not being successful at paying my bills. I was not being successful at going to class. Like, things were, things were difficult. <clears throat> so I got a dog. So this is Scout. Um, Scout, at the, Scout at the time had been returned to the shelter twice for being so bad. Um, and I was determined not to be the third person to return Scout to the shelter. It was really close, really close. Um, <clears throat> at one point, I was standing on my kitchen counters crying because the dog was going berserk and I didn't know what to do. Um, but anyway, so I got a dog. And I thought, I'll look after the dog. And the nice thing about dogs is that you meet some really interesting people. The bad things about dogs is that you meet some really interesting people and you have to walk the dog, you know, often. Um, but while doing that, I met some, um, I met another woman um, who was a professor at Ohio State and she convinced me to take this class called Organismal Diversity. So I took this class um, and it blew my mind. So Organismal Diversity was just a class introducing you to all the different kinds of life forms in the world. So plants, animals, just all the different kinds of life. And up until this point, because I was so focused on music or um, occupational therapy, I was just thinking, you know, humans. So life, life that was enjoyable on Earth were humans and dogs. I didn't really care about all the other, well, I cared about dolphins. But all, at that point, I didn't really care about anything else. Um, and she really opened my eyes. So then I thought, okay, well, I'm not doing well in music. I'm going to go back, go back to biology and see, see, how this, see how this goes. And so at that point, she let me volunteer in her lab. And this is Meg up here with the squid hat on. Who would not want to be her friend, right? You think this is fun. She's so much fun. And so <clears throat> she let me volunteer in her lab and join her lab group. And she gave me a project to work on. So just looking at the genetic variability of coral. So off the coast of Oman, there's a, a cold water upwelling. And so probably as most of you guys know, cold water likes warm environments. So think of like Bahamas, you know, Caribbean, they like warm water. Cold water is actually kind of stressful for them. But here off the coast of Oman, they're warm water for half the year. And then they have the seasonal upwelling and they're in cold water. And so we were wondering, she was wondering, um, is there any genetic difference between this coral versus the coral in Hawaii versus the coral in the uh, Caribbean? Um, so I went out to, to check to see if, is there genetic diversity? Uh, the answer is no. So that didn't get published. But it was still fun, still fun to work on. And it opened up some opportunities for me. So um, at this point, I'm about halfway through my junior year. And I have decided that this is what I want to do for my life. So I really had to kick it into gear to uh, get that GPA up and to get all the classes that I needed. But it allowed me to do some other things. Like um, I took this one class, this tropical ecology class, where I spent part of the semester in Costa Rica doing different research projects. So up here in the corner, uh, where we collected sea anemones. So many of you guys have seen Nemo, Finding Nemo. Nemo's a, so not Nemo, but the house that Nemo lived in, that, that's the anemone. Um, so here we're actually making anemones fight. The interesting thing about anemones is that um, they fight extremely slowly. So it takes like a whole day to throw a punch. Um, but if you're patient, it's really exciting. Plus the, the lab you got to work in was air conditioned, which was like the only lab I think in the whole country that was air conditioned. So that was great. <clears throat> um, but it just allowed me to do these different things and explore different areas of science. Uh, <clears throat> and I rushed through and I was able to graduate on time. And then I had to go join the real world. And so at this point, I got a job at Caribou Coffee. Not a member, it's all right. Uh, got a job at Caribou Coffee. There is one thing I'll say is that I did drink a lot of coffee. So driving home, like the colors would be brighter. <laughs> The snow would sparkle more. Uh, totally am okay with the word of wisdom. Don't drink that much coffee. Um, but meanwhile, Meg still let me work in her lab, still volunteer, and she helped point out some other opportunities for me. Um, so caribou coffee was not fun. 
Um, but I did meet this woman at the time, Andy Wolf, who was a botanist, and she let me chase her all over South Africa collecting plants, which was uh, amazing. At the time, it wasn't. You can see me in the background under Plan G, being pretty grumpy that I'm chasing her through the Fambros, um, <clears throat> carrying her tent, which I did not sleep in. I slept in the, on the ground by the tent. Uh, but it was, it was a really great experience to be able to live in South Africa for a while and work on these scientific projects that she had. And that's what really spurred me to go back to school and, um, and focus on my master's. So I joined Meg's lab, and I worked on the, this intertidal sea anemone called Anthoplera elegantissima and looking at some of the characteristics of it and how are they genetically related. And this allowed me to go see different parts of the world. So I lived in Friday Harbor, Washington for a while doing some research um, and finished up my master's here. And at that point, I again looked around. So I had met these two wonderful women who mentored me and helped me get through my master's when I looked around and to see what other people were doing who were my age. Well, they were getting married and having kids. Not that that's bad. We should all do this and things like that. Um, get a job. Not that that's bad. We should all strive to get a job and do things like that. Um, <clears throat> but I was uh, trying to figure out what to do when I met the missionaries. And this is all, again, thanks to Scout. So I was walking Scout one night, and two guys came up to me, and they said, hello, hello, I'm from Northern California. I'm from Southern California. Can we tell you about Jesus and come to your house? And I was like, what? <laughs> no, I live by myself, and my dog likes you, so she's not going to attack. <clears throat> um, so uh, I found out later that that was not their, their plan uh, to attack uh, me or anything. A spiritually attack, not like physically. Uh, so they would come by every day for about a year, and we would talk about Jesus and the church and things like that. And I was getting ready to graduate and move on and um, didn't know what the next thing was. So like, uh, like I've pretty much done my whole life, I turned to Scout for guidance. And she liked the missionaries. They seemed like good people. They seemed like a good thing. Um, so I joined the church <clears throat> at that point. And it was right around then, so right after I got baptized, I went to a meeting in Mexico, so a scientific meeting in Mexico, and um, met this guy. So this is Scott France, and he works on deep sea coral. And he's been places that have never like, been seen by another human ever and might never be seen by another human ag again, like ever. And I thought, that's really cool. That's what I want to do. But I didn't know how to go about doing that. Um, <clears throat> so I had just gotten baptized, and I thought, well, I'll apply for my PhD down here with Scott France, studying um, the connectivity, genetic connectivity of these deep sea coral. And um, <clears throat> I thought, well, I just joined the church. If it doesn't work out, I can just fade into the background, and no one will know, um, and it'll be okay. Scout won't be disappointed in me. The missionaries won't be disappointed. It'll work out. So I moved to Louisiana. So this is, we're now in Plan J. Moved to Louisiana, uh, start studying deep sea coral. The thing about deep sea coral is it's so deep that you can't swim there. You take a submarine. Um, <clears throat> so you go on these big boats, and you can see the submarine uh, Jason, so Jason is the name of one of the subs, and it's plopped overboard. So you don't get to ride in, at least this particular one, you don't get to ride into it. It's about the size of a Volkswagen. They plop it overboard. It has cameras on it. It's being controlled um, on deck, and you see all these really cool organisms. So, I don't know. So the purple thing is a deep sea cucumber. The one beside it that looks like a roly-poly is basically this size roly-poly. Um, so you see lots of really interesting things. Meanwhile, you're up here in the, the control van, so C is free with the green shirt on, and you're basically, it's like TV shopping. You're like, ooh, I want that, and the uh, submarine will collect it, and it brings everything up, and then you get to go through it, and you get to take it home and do genetics and stuff on it. Um, so this was great. The only problem with working on a uh, ship is you're out at sea for like a month. And you are working every day 
for a month. So it gets pretty tiring. But you do make these relationships um, with people that last. And you ha have the opportunity to not only work on your project, but work on other people's projects and meet lots of mentors. So I'd gone from only having Meg and Andy as a mentor to during my PhD having a dozen mentors who are helping me out and helping me along through my PhD. Um, <clears throat> and there is time for fun on these boats. So the red suit is called a, it's called a Gumby suit. So if the boat, so like I said, if there's a plan, when you're on a boat, you have a plan for everything. You have a minute to get into this suit. Because if the boat sinks, you need to be in something warm, right? So the cold water is actually what kills you, not, not sharks like you're led to believe. Um, but the cold water usually is what kills you first. So you have a minute to squeeze into this wetsuit. How many of you guys have squeezed into a wetsuit in one minute? Yeah, not unless you're covering yourself with baby oil and... Anyway, I could show you some tricks. Um, if you... If you... Wait, do I want to tell you that? There's a YouTube video of us doing it. Just let you figure that out on your own. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so there's time for fun. Uh, we were out at sea once and it was dressed like a pirate day, so that happened. Um, <clears throat> but you go from having almost no contact, being really isolated, to all of a sudden having all these mentors and helping you come up with your plan, working on your dissertation. And, um, and not only are you working on your dissertation at this time, but also you're able to have impacts on the world. So this kind of idea of going out and serve, um, you can do that uh, in the academic environment. So I was able to work, so the deep sea horizon, or deep water horizon oil spill, work on that and help collect animals and assess that. And so um, grad school was really, really good for me, and I wouldn't have been able to get through it without all these people helping. But like all, um, all good things, they have to come to an end. So I did eventually graduate. So that was the plan K to graduate. No one's as surprised as I am that this actually happened. Um, and then it was trying to figure out what is the next plan? What do we do next? Uh, while in graduate school, I met my husband at Institute. Institute works. You learn lots of things. Just leave it at that. Uh, <clears throat> and don't worry, if you've seen him, he's shaved since. He doesn't look like a member of Swamp People uh, and had twins. But I looked around and tried to figure out what could I do with a PhD. And the, uh, it was really despondent because there wasn't much that I could do. We were, we were really, it was really hard. We were really poor. Kyle was only eating one meal a day um, so that um, we could buy diapers and stuff for the kids. And I just thought, like, what are we doing? Like, all this, all this education, I can't get a job. Um, <clears throat> trying to take care of the kids, what do we do? And at this point, we hadn't paid our tithing for maybe eight months. And we were called in to do tithing settlement. And I thought, there's no way. There's no way. We'll just be, we just won't be full tithe payers. And Kyle said, no, we, we need to. We need to do this. And so rent was due in three days. But we wrote a check for basically like $900 to cover our tithing for the year and um, went to the tithing settlement. And we said, yes, we're full tithe payers. Can you help us pay our rent? <laughs> we don't have enough money. <laughs> and he said, you know, the bishop was really kind. And he said, I'll help you out, but you got to help me out. Um, so on LDS Jobs, you need to go fill out a profile on LDS Jobs. Learn how it works and I'll help you, and then I'll send people to you so you can help them fill out this, a profile in LDS jobs in terms of getting a job. Because at this point, it's been almost a year with no job, just adjuncting different places. So I did that, and I thought, this is ridiculous. This is, this is ridiculous. Who's going to need a PhD uh, in genetics and marine biology? Um, this is why I don't see a lot of um, um, people like me in the sciences, um, trying to raise a family plus take care of them financially. Um, so I filled out the profile, and about a week later, I got an email uh, from Dr. Dave Bybee saying, I saw your profile. I'd like you to apply. The job position at BYU has been closed, but I saw this. I felt prompted to 
check LDS jobs and I saw your profile and I'd like you to apply. So you have to get all this stuff together and send it in. Uh, I didn't know what uh, like the ecclesiastical reference was, like I didn't know what any of this stuff was. So it was kind of a miracle, I got it all done. And then about a week after sending that all in, he said, we really liked your application. We'd like to do an interview with you. And so I said, okay, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it's hot. Um, so, um, so about a week after that, I got the phone interview. And then about a week after that, uh, I got asked if I wanted to come for an uh, interview on campus. So this is us on campus. And we thought, we've never been to Hawaii. Why, why not? <laughs> we'll, come, we'll, we'll come interview there, sure. Um, so we came for the interview. Um, and lo and behold, we got the job. So within a span of about two months of being totally despondent, not knowing what's going on with our life, um, but being mentored by my husband and by our bishop to pay tithing and take these um, steps forward, we were able to um, find a job. And so that's really taught me that mentorship is important. So your plans might change. I never planned to work here at BYU. I just was never on my radar. I just never thought of it. I never planned to have twins. Not that you could plan that, but you know, but it's worked out great so far. I never planned to get married. It's been pretty awesome, mostly except for the socks everywhere. Um, I never planned for graduate school. It's just kind of looking around and seeing what could I do, what inspires me. And so I think that it's really important here at BYU not only to, um, to be able to do your service, but also to provide mentorship to those people around you. And so I've had the opportunity to mentor these three girls. And so the one up in the red shirt, that's Azita. She's just graduated from optometry school. And um, with her, and she did her master's at the same time um, while in optometry school. Hannah Knott, the one like, that's Hannah, she just graduated from dental school. And then Alyssa right now is off in the Atlantic somewhere recording whales for her, for her masters. Um, but not only um, on the mainland, but also here. So I don't know how many of you guys know Leah or Lacey or Ashlyn and Katie, but I've been able to work with some really amazing individuals here and mentor them. And they're now going on to do really big and great things and so I think it's really important to be able to have those people in your life that push you to do the things that are hard and to do the things that are uncomfortable and to do the things that you never thought you could do. Um, and then always um, their scout. This is a picture of scout this morning. She's still with us. She's 17 years old. <laughs> uh, but she's still driving me and pushing me to do these hard things. And I certainly know I wouldn't have been brave enough to do these things, like talk to the missionaries, move all the way to Louisiana with just her, um, come out to Hawaii um, without her. So in conclusion, um, just have to say that mentors and mentorships are really important. And it's also really important to have a plan and to move toward that plan boldly, even knowing that it'll change. Um, and more often than not, for the better. Uh, you'll look around and say, this is hard. Why am I doing this? I don't, I didn't, you know, I started off with biology at Ohio State and it was hard, but I was able to uh, leave and then come back. Um, to, to pay tithing was hard, but doing the, following that rule, I'm able to see the blessings in my life. Um, so do those things that are hard because they will be rewarded in the long run. And then the other thing is that no man is an island. You don't exist by yourself. Even if you do feel by your, that you're all by yourself and things are hard and difficult, there are people around you who care about you, who want to help you, and who are just waiting for the opportunity to do that. And so I would urge you to not only serve others, but allow others to serve you. So I know that's really difficult. Um, at least I know for me, it's really difficult to allow others to serve me because I'm I like to be in control, and I like to um, boss people around, I guess. Um, but to allow people to help do that is a very hard thing, but you're allowing them to have blessings in their lives and your life to be blessed. And then the last thing I'll leave you with is be kind to dogs because they can make you better and braver than you really are. 
Um, the other dog is now Charlie Bucket. We've accidentally adopted another dog. So anyway, with that, take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. 